So, hello fellow Earthlings. This is Earthling 645546-3728. And there's no such thing as human DNA. I did a short about this, and I just felt compelled. I mean, I've already talked about the fact that I don't think that GMO foods are anything special. A lot of people look at it as Franken food. You know, you get some DNA from this, you get some worse DNA, and you get some uh, termite DNA, and then you get some uh, DNA from a radish, and you jam all of these things together. And what do you have? You have some kind of worse radish, termite, whatever. And I think part of the reason why people have that belief is because they ascribe a kind of ownership to DNA sequences when there is nothing like that. In this short, I already went in over the fact that DNA is like Lego. If you build like a building or an elephant or a dinosaur or a whale out of Lego, you're not going to say that you used whale Lego to build the Lego whale. You're going to say you used Lego to build the whale. And you can build anything with Lego. And it's the same thing with the DNA. <laughs> the fact that you can take DNA from a whale and put it into a radish or into an avocado or into a mouse that tells you that it's not whale DNA there's nothing inherently whaleish about the DNA just the order of the sequences and the order of sequences in a particular spot in the genome of a whale is not gonna do the same exact thing as it would do necessarily when you put it into a pigeon. It's just a sequence of, uh, you know, those, I can't remember the exact term for A, G, C, T. That's all that it is. It's a bunch of sequenced letters. So I think, you know, people really do in their heads are thinking, oh, I'm eating some corn, and you say that there was some DNA from a, uh, a jellyfish in this? Oh my god, let me look at this corn. Which part of it looks like a jellyfish? That's not how it works. <laughs> that That is completely ridiculous. That is not how it works whatsoever in any way, shape, or form. You know? Um, the human, the way that, that animals work and operate and function, the proteins that are built are not all built for, you know, physical features. Of course, that's what we, we would think in our heads. And this is, this is not directly 100% related to the point, but I think it sufficiently overlaps. We keep thinking of physical manifestations. I think people call them phenotypes. Um, things that are physically typed. For example, like, you know, dark skin in black people or um, eyes that people might refer to as Asian looking eyes. Uh, we keep thinking of those when we think of specific species, organisms, um, races, but that's not what it's about. That's not what the genotype is about. It's oftentimes it's about proteins. And proteins make certain eyes appear in a certain way, I think. I might be wrong. Um, but proteins make uh, the features of your face. And it's not the other way around. It's not that you take the features of Muddy's face and you say, I'm going to take that directly and put that into another organism. And, yeah, 
that's that's really all that I wanted to say. I guess this is not going to be a particularly long one, but um, I think it it just really comes down to this idea of ownership. We think of the DNA sequence that comes from a particular organism, even though it might very well appear in. For, so, for example, we're going to take some uh, genes from let's say genes from a human being and uh, put it into some corn and we are thinking okay well you take those genes out of the human being and you put it into corn so now you moved it so now this corn is a bit more human well aside from the fact um, the overwhelmingly large number of genes and DNA sequences that there are. So if you really, really want to, to put it, you know, in, in a numerical uh, system, I am sure that with this slightly more humanized corn, if you do something like that, um, it's probably going to be like 0.000000% human, you know? So there's no need, or if you put jellyfish DNA into uh, some corn, it's going to be 0 0.000, con considering how long. I mean, I've heard it described that um, if you unfurled the DNA in, uh, in a human being or in other organisms, sometimes it can wrap around the entire Earth. So you have something that you would never be able to see its thickness because it's molecules thick but yet it's so long there's so much of it that you can practically wrap around the, the earth however many times um well maybe it's not quite that long i'm not sure but it's still astoundingly long so yeah and then there are sequences that up might be already in the corn so you might oh my oh my goodness let's take this dna from a human being and put it in the corn there might be that sequence already in the corn and you might just have to move it from one spot here to this other spot here but you know what since you already know what it does in the human you won't even bother to look along the whole sequence of the corn's dna to see if it's already there and to just move it but even if we did not have genetic engineering one day that mutation could happen on its own eventually if we are just you know randomly propagating and, and collecting the best of, se of species and that same exact uh, transference of DNA that already exists in the corn can move to the place that we wanted to move it to uh, the copy from the human into a new space on the corn it could happen on its own because it's already in the corn and we could have the same thing happen again anyway and that already happens all the time with bacteria it already happens with viruses they swap DNA with each other all the time that's why you can have all of these antibiotic resistant types of bacteria because as long as there's one type that type of antibiotic resistant bacteria can pass its DNA onto even unrelated other bacteria. That's this kind of thing is happening all the time without human beings being a part of it at all. And because we don't understand, and there is no news story headline: antibiotic uh, resistant virus shares part of its DNA with an E. coli uh, ordinary virus. Nobody, there's no reporter on the ground on the ground to check you know genetic sequences and say that this thing happened so there's nobody that realizes it until somebody gets sick in a hospital or some other place and and you realize oh e coli now has this antibiotic resistance that um mers had you know like two years ago we had a mers patient that had this and now e coli has this and now sars has this and now a coronavirus has this it is just so frustrating and ridiculous to me that so many people misunderstand this. I asked a a doctor that I knew about GMO and, and all this other stuff. And I was surprised that she was kind of like, 
yeah, I know that it's not really too good for you. And I'm like, how do you know? How do you? And, and this is one of the things that is is kind of hilarious to me. We assume that all of the foods that we eat currently are good for us. And there's no problems with any of them. They're all, everything and all of the foods that we eat are this, this goodness. When, for example, with respect to beans, um, apparently uh, legumes have this thing called anti-nutrients that prevents us from absorbing a lot of the minerals in beans, in uh, leafy vegetables, in grains. So you look at a grain, for example, you look it up and you see, okay, well, grains have magnesium and uh, spinach. Spinach has a lot of iron in it. And uh, this other thing, peanuts, they have all of this magnesium in it. So I'm going to get that. No, you're not. Soy, legumes, um, what's the name of it? Uh, that Popeye eats, spinach, all of these different types of foods have compounds in it. Um, phyt phytic acid is what is in beans. You, and when you soak these beans, it leaches some of this phytic acid out of the beans, which phytic acid, basically if you have some beans and you have some milk and you think you're getting calcium from the milk, the phytic acid, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, in the beans or the peanuts or the soy or the oxalates that are in spinach or in kale or in any number of different foods can grab on to that calcium that you thought that you were getting from the milk or from the cheese or from the yogurt and say nope 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 there are things that we eat in foods that are not necessarily good for us i mean it's better than eating nothing it's better than eating um i don't know but not everything that is there that's presented for us is this great thing if they if scientists could come up with foods that did not have these oxalates in them and these uh, uh phytase well it's not phytase is the name of the thing that uh breaks down the phytic acid in beans but we don't have that uh, enzyme in our bodies so we can't break apart uh, those compounds and get the calcium and the iron and the magnesium and the zinc all of it as a matter of fact right now in order to combat my calcium deficiency I am making sure that when I eat the cheese that's supposed to give me the calcium that I might be deficient in, that I wait two hours before I have, you know, rice and beans, or I have some peanuts, or I have some popcorn, or I have some spinach, or anything like that. That's what I'm doing right now because of what I've read. And I have, uh, you know, like different foods. And in, in before I cook them, I'm looking to soak them a lot more now, making sure that I'm using them in, in a pressure cooker. We have this idea that I remember there's uh, uh, some conservative politician who was like, look at this banana. It's made so perfectly. And, you know, obviously this is a sign of intelligent design that, you know, uh, a higher being made this banana only to have to recant all of that because he realized that bananas have been domesticated and they're not made that way. The wild bananas have a bunch of seeds in them. They're not very nutritious. And that's the thing with everything. That's the thing with potatoes. That's the thing with uh, wheat. It's the thing with everything. We had this beginning food, you know, that whichever population group just decided to keep growing over and over and over again and, and taking the best of it and and using it corn corn can't self-propagate itself if if there was I, I was looking at the story that there's so many different foods that if human beings went extinct they would follow us into extinction because they cannot survive without us to propagate them so many species of, of dogs to go on a, on a slight tangent or whatever that would not that only live by caesarean section if there were no humans number one i guess they would not become inseminated they might not have or if they did you know the mother and the babies would die and that's the same thing with cattle it's the same thing probably with 
a lot of animals um you know uh i'm looking trying to think of besides dogs um but yeah we look around in the world and we think that we have i guess a lot of us do think that there was this garden of eden and you know a higher power just made everything the way that it should be the way that it is and and that's what we're we're living in so not to get too far away from the point which i already clearly have but yeah just because people or scientists take lego blocks dna lego and they move it from here to here they didn't spoil the food they're just hastening what we were doing all the time for thousands of years when when uh, you know a new crop of corn or potato or whatever we do not know how it got those genes that made it different we have no idea now we do so if you think that what we're doing now is franken food what we were doing in the past was equally franken food it's just that we didn't know how it worked anyway that's just my two th- two cents on that um hey thanks for listening if you got to this point peace